live brunch. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Live Brunch. Live Brunch. Live Brunch. Welcome to another episode of Live Brunch. I am back. My, Matt Carvel tried to usurp me last week, but I <laughs> grabbed the reins back off him and I am back in the seat. Bring where... back calves. Bring back calves. <laughs> oh, on that note, you mentioned that David wrote countless psalms. The answer is 73. Mm. 73 is not a countless I, number. I can only count to 72. Well, that's the problem with you then. 73 is the number of Psalms that David wrote, not countless. Okay. <laughs> but does this... writing poetry make you more passionate as well? Well, Johan would know because he's, he's the poet amongst us. He's written loads of uh, pieces. Uh, would you say you'd like to read one Would now? you say I've written <laughs> countless pieces of poetry again? <laughs> if you've written 73, then I would. <laughs> I can see mad boring holes into us. Uh, this, so in, in Live Brunch, people ask questions. Uh, we're with Toby Ford Weston, who just preached to us on disagreeing well. Um, so good. From the so story of Saul and David. Brilliant. Thanks mm -hmm. so much, Tobes. And we've got the wonderful Ruth Davenport, who's with us. Uh, we're just going to look at some questions. We've got some questions written down, but some questions have come from the chat, which we will be looking into to really look at how we can practically apply um, what Toby has just spoken to us about. So. Um, as part of Emmanuel, we do small groups, um, so we gather in community groups. I think we are on the last week of our small groups for this term. Um, but in that small group, if you're in a small group, we've got some questions for you. Um, if you're in a small group, sign in for the last week. It's not a bad thing. Meet some people for the first time. Be fun. Here is the small group questions. The first one, think about your nature, nurture, and lived experience. Do these make you generally more agreeable or disagreeable? The second question. If Jesus says, love your enemies, then who is that for you? Who do you find it difficult to love? And the third question, we came to Jesus because he won our heart, not an argument with us. What does this teach us about what God is like and how we should relate to others? And Ruth, I know you've been really keen to answer the, the question about who your enemies are. <laughs> but why don't we look at the last question? We came to Jesus because he won our heart, not an argument with us. What does this teach us about what God is like? and how we should relate to others? Uh, wow, these are all great questions. Um, and I like that you asked me, you thought, who's going to be the most disagreeable person in the church? They'll be great for live brunch, so thank you for that. But it is, it's even, even just reading it now again, it's one of those questions that I feel like you have to sort of keep uh, mulling over, and the more you do, the, the deeper it goes. And just, again, thinking on your preach, it was so good, Toby, but it's really humbling. We come to Jesus because he won our heart, and again, it's so our flesh kind of this, you can feel that like reaction, that rebellion that sort of wants to try and earn it a little bit or try and control it a little bit. But when you, the more you sit and, and mull over the fact that he's won our heart, that kind of it just, it strips off the pride and it's, it's really humbling. And that's, um, yeah, that's the, the basis of how we need to do all these conversations, isn't it? To teach about what God is like and how we should relate to others. We will look at, we will look at, at the place of apologetics in, uh, I guess, in Christian conversation mm. and ahead in live brunch. But just looking at one of our more topical questions. Mm. Um, over the weekend, there's been protests in London against lockdown. Mm -hmm. Is that an example of disagreeing well? And is protesting ever something a Christian should do? Yes, good question. I think that um, um, nonviolent protesting is 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 okay, um, but I kind of I suppose I'd want to make the point that actually, generally speaking, in the Bible, um, protesting isn't really something that you see um, in the positive in the Bible. In fact, you kind of see it in the Bible in a negative way. So, for example, it could be said that uh, when uh, Jesus was up for um, kind of crucifixion, the crowd chanted, crucify him, crucify him. Uh, that isn't held up as a, as a positive example or a positive thing. And, and, and time and time again, the, the, the Bible uh, gives us, the, the, the wisdom the Bible gives in situations of injustice isn't actually to protest, although I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but it actually gives us first importance really is to pray. And so when we uh, look at um, Acts chapter 12 and we see Peter is thrown into prison unjustly, um, the Christians of the day in the, in the New Testament, they didn't go out and start protesting. They didn't. 
what they did was they prayed. They prayed and then essentially Peter was dramatically released through angelic visitation. And so, and so when we see even the Old Testament, we see God talks in, uh, in, in two chronicles about, um, he talks about if my people will humble themselves and pray, and he goes, I will, I will heal their land. And I don't think many people would argue that there are areas of our land in this country that need healing. And it doesn't actually say if my people humble themselves and protest. It says if my people fast, which is what he means by humble themselves and pray. So I think that protesting isn't a bad thing, so don't hear me wrong. What I'm saying is that if, um, if our first response is to go out and protest, I think that there's something mm. disconnected there. Our first response to all of these things is to go to, to God because ultimately he is the one that can initiate true and lasting change. And while protesting is not unimportant, the reality is the fruit of protesting is usually superficial. Some rule or law changes which are not unimportant. I spent many years of my life training to be a barrister, studying the law, etc. Cetera, et cetera. I'm not saying that's not important. It is important, but ultimately that won't make the streets safer for women. Uh, that won't really, from the heart of people, make change things. But what we want, if you're a Christian, surely is something deeper than rule change. We want rule change, but we want heart change, which is kind of what I mentioned in the, in the preach. And so praying really does that. So he, don't hear me wrongly, protesting peacefully is not a bad thing, but prayer is the biblical kind of response to injustice we see time and time again and consistently. Mm. Brilliant. That is brilliant. Mm. Thank you. Um, I think let's, let's look at the apologetics question before we go into some of the questions that have come in mm. on the chat. Apologetics uh, is, the, uh, is giving a reason for your faith. And the study, the study of doing that being, ha having a response to some of the questions. Mm. Uh, is God real? Where is he? Uh, what's the meaning of life? It's all of those big questions which, which we, are, we, are, we, are, we are encouraged to have a reason for our faith as is written in one of the, the books in the Bible. Yeah. Um, you talked a lot about winning hearts mm -hmm. and not about winning arguments. Yeah. Where does the, what is the place of apologetics mm. uh, in that conversation? Yeah, uh, well, there is a big place. I mean, apologetics is a, excuse me, a really important uh, piece in the puzzle. Um, it's not just as simple as A and not B. And um, what I, I, I was careful to say in the message was that um, winning uh, arguments is not unimportant, but actually true and lasting change comes by winning hearts. And, and so therefore it's not unimportant. It is important. And, um, uh, when, we, um, when we speak truth to people in love, um, I, I, think, it, I think for me it's not so much about the winning of arguments. I, I'll tell you a story. I, um, when I was in uni, I, I, I put a, a, <laughs> a stand, a few of us from the sort of like Christian Union, and I said, and I put, I can prove Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, in 15 minutes. I literally, and people would sort of walk by to and fro, and then one or two people would come to me, and so I'd literally, I remember, we'd set the, the watch, and they'd like, almost like, come on, prove it to me. And I'd go to kind of Isaiah, and I'd talk about the suffering servant, and I did it in 15 minutes. I was like, therefore, because da 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 da. And um, I remember one guy in particular, he was there, and I'd finished, I'd done it in 15 minutes, like 14 minutes. And I was expecting him to fall down on his knees and praise God and start speaking in tongues or something. Um, that didn't happen, and his response was kind of like, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, he said, thanks. And he walked off, and I was like, bah, bah, I just proved it. And I, I learned that day that actually, um, while I could be correct, uh, and it really takes a, a work of God to really do something in heart. So to answer your question, it is important, and it, it's an, an area that I'm personally fascinated about. And when you're a preacher, that you do do a lot of, of research and thinking through these things. Um, so I, I wouldn't want to demean the place of apologetics. It's important, but let's not forget the vital work of winning hearts through loving and serving one another. Brilliant. Anything you want to add to that, Ruth? <clears throat> No, just the fact that, as you say, it's it's it is compelling. It's and and not even from a theological point of view, but um, kind of like what you say, learning to disagree well. That's uh, apologetics is learning how to disagree well within theology. But we want to be able to disagree well even outside of theology in in all of life. And so when you have that uh, apologetic foundation, a solid um, foundation, then all the other areas you can you can have that way of being able to. Um, rationalize and control your emotions and, and just think like Christine said a few weeks ago, the importance of being able to think about things well. Um, so yeah, they have a huge place. They're mm. vitally important. Yeah. 
Great, let's, let's go into those then. Um, how do you disagree well with someone on an issue that's personal to them if you have not been in their position? Yeah, um, I, I, I think it's possible to. Um, I think that, again, one needs to think um, uh, or, or, or really empathise and, and love uh, the person because often these things are not just mental kind of, you know, checklists and, oh, yeah, so I therefore win the argument. It's there are emotions involved. Uh, and so not saying that we can't, um, but when appropriate, we, we, we must. But again, the whole disagreeing and correcting uh, opponents, you know, people that we're t talking to in gentleness, I think that's really where that comes in. It's important if something is wrong to um, where, where appropriate. It's not everything that is wrong that you have to start disagreeing with. You have to, we learn to forbear certain things. You think, you know what, I'm just not going to say anything because it's not worth, it's not, it's not a real issue. It's not a hill I'm willing to, to die upon, as it were. Um, but actually connecting, uh, c c correcting in gentleness, I think is really important in those issues where you haven't been through it, but actually you know that, you know, chances are, the Bible was saying something, Jesus has been through it, and you can speak with authority and gentleness through the scriptures. Mm. Mm. I listened to a really great talk last night on empathy and whether empathy is a sin or not. It was fascinating. But um, one of the comments was uh, the, the importance of seeking to understand and how you can understand without affirming something mm. and how often so much of our disagreement is because either we haven't, uh, we've misunderstood and we, haven't, we need clarity on the definitions of simple words. You know, the importance of w words, they can yeah. really make or break an agreement or not. But, but um, yeah, when, you, when you're... Uh, goal is, is love and, and understanding, then you can lead into that without, that doesn't necessarily equate to, you know, I'm affirming what you're saying, or I, um, I, I've, even though I haven't been there, people can sense that, hey, they can sense when you're just trying to tick a box or mm. win an argument or... Mm -hmm. mm. Mm. I think this is such a big question because it, it, it goes into the issue of race, it goes into the issue of violence against women, it goes into it a whole bunch, bunch of issues mm. because... Uh, and in some ways, there, there could be an arrogance which says, hey, you're not in the position, you've not experienced what I've experienced, so don't you dare speak to me mm. about the situation. Mm -hmm. um, when, if we're going to the Bible, and if you're going to what, what the Bible teaches us, really that should be something that is, is objective. It, mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not our subjective interpretation of what Good. Scripture is teaching us. It, it's what, if God is the plumb line, then his Scripture is the plumb line, and then what the Bible teaches on certain, on certain issues is what we look for. So we're, we're looking less at what the experience is, mm. and in some ways... I guess your experience, if you've experienced the same thing that the other person has, your, your views could be cloud, cloudy, mm -hmm. but you go to the Bible mm -hmm. and you say, well, what does, let's look at the Bible together. What yeah. does the Bible teach us on these yeah. things? And, and really, it, it would be arrogant to assume that, oh, there's only people in my situation who can explain the Bible to me in a way that I can understand mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when it does go wider than that. And I think as well, just taking an example, I mean, you know, if a doctor came up to someone, um, let's say a person had a, an illness, and the doctor said, right, this is what you need to do. This is what we need to do to get you well. I suppose that person could say, you don't know what I've been through. You've Absolutely. never been through it. Brilliant. But actually you say, no, 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 this, 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 this person has some wisdom and I'm going to listen, even though they may never have been through it. And, uh, and so that, that could be applied to the situation as well. Mm -hmm. But on the flip side, Jesus became a man and mm. became a human being yes. to empathize with us and because he could say, oh, I've experienced it mm -hmm. and I understand. And, yeah. But it's also, as you say, because even, even if you have gone through what someone else has gone through, like no, no situation, you can't compare these situations. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. even if it's, 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 I find it actually almost more frustrating if someone's like, oh, I know what you mean because I've, and it's just like, yeah. no, you don't know yeah, what I mean, even if you've had a similar situation. So it's, it's loving them by asking questions as much as possible to understand where they've been. It's like, doesn't matter if you've been through the same thing, their situation is unique to them. And you want to, yeah, I love them in, in, in that, in that unique context. Mm. Yeah, there is a longing in us for, to be empathized with, isn't it? Mm. And, and that's why Jesus is the great empathizer. Yeah, yes. for sure. Um, Amen. He became one of us and experienced tremendous hardship and difficulty. So oh, if the, if the verse has gone blank, it's uh, who became just like us. Mm. The, that mm. was. <laughs> mm. um, so yeah, okay, uh, another question. I try and disagree with gentleness with my friend, but they're not so gentle. It's really draining. Should I drop the friendship? Yes, oh no. God, It was friendship, not my husband texting you. <laughs> 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 um, um, the, the, the answer is, um, without knowing the, the, the facts, probably not. Um, uh, 
you know, uh, we are called to be uh, long-suffering. Mm. Um, even in the scripture that I, I read, it talks about um, uh, sort of suffering long. And with the, the, the preach, David, he, he was persecuted for years, uh, years and years and years that Saul was trying to kill him. And um, he didn't just basically throw his hands up in the air. No, he had this love for them, uh, a love that pursues. And I just think about myself and my story and, and so many of our stories where God has pursued us and, um, <laughs> and he, didn't dis he didn't agree with our sin in our, our former lives, if you're not a Christian yet, let's say. Um, but he didn't give up. Uh, and uh, the reality is God can, can break through mm. at any moment, any time. You look at um, the Apostle Paul, who was actually formerly known, or he was, his name is Saul, actually, but he's referred to as, as Paul. And he, just in a moment, um, Jesus met with him. And uh, often when we are disagreeing with gentleness, uh, are correcting opponents with gentleness, it's not the matter of minutes. Uh, we're often talking about the work of years. We're talking about the mm. work sometimes of decades. You look at some of the um, great men and, and women um, who have really uh, done great work in civil rights. I, I spoke about uh, Martin Luther King briefly, and um, it, it didn't just—he wasn't just gentle on one occasion and then okay, oh, well, that's great. No, no, he persisted and persisted, and that—that that really is the work of a Christian to continue to persevere until the very end, and in mm. hope and prayer. So. Again, there, there may be some circumstances in which we may say, actually, well, you know, if they're, you know, attacking you or, you know, physically or, you know, there, there, there may be uh, things that, of that nature that you think, well, actually, that will change it. But generally speaking, I'd say no, persevere and keep praying. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm that friend. I'm so grateful for the people who've st stuck in my life when I've disagreed mm. non-gently. And, yeah. and it's been such a journey for me, and it still is a journey for me. That So all the people who haven't given up on me, I am so grateful. And I'm in the presence of people who do do it gently, and that's slowly, slowly sort of mm. shaping me. Um, so, so do definitely stick with the person. But um, yeah, and, and hold on to truth. Gentle answer turns away. Well, it's not, not, not a truth, but it's a, a you know, good advice. Gentle answer turns away. Wrath, but a harsh which shows up anger. Um, but I wonder, in that particular scenario, I wonder if the friend has actually said, so, said that directly to them. You know, I've, I've, I'm struggling with your, the, your lack of gentleness. I'm struggling to, you know, maybe just share it in a gentle way. Maybe, they've, maybe no one's ever told them. Often people who are not gentle, people are too scared to tell them that. Maybe they just need really you to say, hey, I'm really struggling. Um, do you think you could? Yeah, I know people have done, done that in my life and it's been painful, but I'm grateful mm. for it. Mm. I guess in this situation, and it would be very similar to a marriage context, is you don't have to do this alone. You don't yes. need to work out this, I guess, this disagreement or this relationship between just the two of you. Mm. Um, seek help. Mm. You know, talk to somebody else. Get the third person involved. Um, we did the marriage course uh, about a year ago when we first went into lockdown. Uh, and then just having Nick and, and Scylla um, speaking to us, but through video. Mm. Uh, and, and it just really helped our marriage. Mm. It, it, yeah, we disagree about stuff, but then just having something objective. Yes. You're, you're listening, you're, you're, you're learning, you're unpacking, uh, having them as like, a, I guess, a, a third spoke in your, in your marriage is brilliant, mm -hmm. it's really helpful. So I think just the key thing is you don't have to work these things out by yourself. Mm -hmm. um, next question. Mm -hmm. Do you think we always need to express our opinion of disagreement or is it better to stay quiet and listen? Um, no, we don't always need to express our opinion of disagreement. Otherwise, I'd be on the first train up to the Emirates Stadium and I'd be speaking to a certain <laughs> Arsenal manager. Um, no, we just don't. Like, it's just, we're not like, it, we, we, we I, I would say, pick your battles. Just in general, in marriage, um, in the workplace, um, with the government, that you may not disagree with certain things. Just simple wisdom, pick your battles it's not every hill that we must die on and and you know if if Jesus disagreed you know came down from heaven and, and wagged his finger at me every time he disagreed mm. with me he would have probably have disagreed with me two or three times already in this <laughs> in this time <laughs> together um you, you know what I mean like he, he doesn't do that actually he, he forbears and he loves and he serves and he prays and and sometimes um a prayer is more powerful than actually saying something, not saying that therefore we don't never ever say anything. There are times that's appropriate and right and important to, to speak, but we need wisdom for these situations. You know, in the workplace, how many times might you disagree with something someone says or something someone does, but you don't say it every time. And I think the main thing, the key thing to show is, is, is that love. And if you do disagree, which we will, and sometimes it's appropriate to do it gently and with grace. Mm. Do you think it's a personality thing that some people are more 
into, yeah. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's the whole nature and nurture thing and lived experience that uh, we have different temperaments and praise God, you know, that's, that's part of the wonderful diversity uh, amongst humanity. And uh, we, we got to work that out mm. between us. Um, what would and be some the pro people... in, in being that then you say, if, if some, because it sounds like, oh, if only I wasn't this, per this pugnacious personality, is there any pros at all in being more keen to? Yeah, I think, I think that people that, um, I don't know if it's a, 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 maybe it's not a temperament thing, I'll say, but people that kind of are willing to stand up and then say something are, are really people that are more likely, in a sense, to kind of see a lot of change. And um, you think about kind of key um, uh, civil rights activists um, or even people uh, biblically, um, you know, they, they're more likely to be kind of leaders, if you like, or uh, we're all leaders in a sense, but uh, God gifts often leaders that desire to kind of want to see change or have the, some sort of gift of activator, uh, as we would, would say in, from uh, Strength Finders, if you, if you know what that, that is. So I think that people that are more like that, they're more likely to see that, and people that are more kind of agreeable, um, they can see change as well, just as much, of course. But I think God uses them in a different way um, to those. So it, there are benefits for, for both, and there are weaknesses for both. Mm. I was saying at the beginning, um, within the, the cultural framework of the United Kingdom, with the language, English language, there are these sayings, and there are an abundance of sayings to say the same thing. It's almost like they've been formed over the years because perhaps it points back to how people are or were anyway in, in the country. And, and that's, that could be a strength, you know, if you just don't step on anybody's toes ever, that could be a, a, a weakness and a strength in, in a sense, in, in, in its right, in its different context. So I, I think it mm. just depends. I think what I found really helpful in that is we, we do something called Strength Finders, Gallup Strength Finders. Mm. And the, the, I've got ideation, activator and competition in my top five strengths, Get out. which basically <laughs> makes me a terrible <laughs> listener. It, it means if somebody's talking, my, my brain is whirling with ideas, which I want to start to make happen. And then if it's not being made happen, I will fight to make sure it happens uh -huh. because I'm competitive. At, at worst, it comes out in my marriage when my, my wife just wants to talk and I'm just, I'm thinking about how do I do stuff with this mm -hmm. and then how do I make it happen? Uh, and sometimes I'm just gonna tell myself, shut up and listen. Mm. Just, you don't have to, this is not a solution finding moment. This is just listen. Mm and empathize with the person. And mm -hmm. sometimes when people are talking, they aren't really looking for you to disagree with them. They just want to get stuff off their chest. Mm -hmm. And it, it might be that they're just processing stuff as they talk as well. And you just mm -hmm. got to let them process. Yeah, uh, yeah, probably teaching mm -hmm. you some But mm -hmm. I think I, I often tell myself, shut up and listen. <laughs> I've actually written it, I've written it on, uh, in the mirror in my bedroom. On Amy's listen. head. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've probably got time for one uh, last question. If I disagree with my parents, I'm guessing a young person has written, so somebody who probably has their parents as authority in their life. If I disagree with my parents about something they've not allowed me to do, do I just need to try harder to win their hearts? Um, well, not necessarily. Um, I, I think, again, it is um, that thing about um, picking your, your battles. Um, you can speak to your parents. You, know, you can say, hey, I felt this was uh, this is a bit un un unfair or, or I just don't agree with this. And um, I think the key thing, again, is how you do it. Mm. Um, uh, but th there's nothing wrong in that. But I think, you know, there comes a point where you may have done that once or twice already and you may just have to say, hey, I'm just going to obey. I'm going to listen. I'm going to, to, to follow through. Um, winning your parents' hearts is a, is a difficult one because your parents, ch chances are you, you've already won your parents' hearts. You, you, your parents <laughs> love you. I mean, I actually love my son. He doesn't have to try to win uh, my heart. But there is something in, in, in being uh, obedient and, and, and listening and, and being quick to obey, that kind of thing. But at the same time, uh, when the, it's, it's right and you feel, you know, I, I do want to talk about this, it, you should be hopefully able to go to them and, and they'd be willing to listen and, and talk about things. But you've got to accept their final kind of answer, really. Brilliant. Um, thanks so much for joining us, Toby and uh, Ruth. And thank you for watching. Uh, we will be back next week with our final talk on yeah. relational wisdom. Yeah, last one. Is the last one. The last one. And then we will stop Easter. talking about relationships yeah. and wisdom. No, we, we, we will continue. Uh, we look forward to seeing you then. Have a great weekend. See you later. Cheers. Bye.